Uh, in a moment, we're going to be welcoming uh, Pastor Kevin Craig to the stage to uh, deliver the sermon this morning. He is a longtime friend of Pine Castle, of Pastor Scott, of Bruce. Uh, Pastor Bruce, my apologies. He is, uh, uh, if you've been here for any length of time, you have seen him. He has been here before. We welcome him back. And we're so excited to have him. Uh, him and his wife Kelly are here. And they uh, pastor at Thrive Church in Apopka, Florida, and have been for almost 30 years. That's awesome. What a legacy. So, Pine Castle, if you would put your hands together and let's welcome Pastor Kevin. I, actually, Bruce, can you and Lisa come back just a second? Um, while they're coming back, I didn't mean to make them work overtime, but um, y'all need to make Lisa work overtime. She needs it. Amen? Only <laughs> well, it, 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 it keeps her from being so fiery. Can you, I, I invited you and your husband. Can you come back with me just a second? So you, see, you were out causing trouble in the foyer, weren't you? My, um, my dad, in his retirement, um, bought one of those hummingbird um, feeders. Anybody ever seen that? And um, he, puts the, he puts the hummingbird uh, stuff in there, and as soon as he puts it in there, these squirrels, it's, it's like you have sounded the dinner bell. And so the squirrels would climb on the hummingbird cleaners, uh, feeder, and he couldn't get the squirrels off. And, you know, it's, it's funny when... You know, I know for some of you that are retired, you understand this. You know, my dad used to manage a big corporation and everything. And so it's funny watching him try to get the squirrels off the hummingbird thing all day. And so he couldn't get them off. So we bought him one of those big super blooper water guns. And so I drove by one day last week and I thought I'd surprise him. And I walked around the back and there he's in the screen porch yelling at the squirrels, shooting his water gun at him. And the squirrels won't move. And I thought, this is what's become of my wonderful, incredible father. He is now fighting with squirrels. But I realized this, when you put the right stuff out, it attracts. When I got up this morning, I got in the car, I was singing the song, which I don't sing well, but I, I just was singing the song, there's something about that name. And I was riding down here this morning, I thought, I wonder if Bruce remembers that song. And I, I wonder if he'd, he wouldn't mind just singing it one time before I preach. As I'm standing here next to my wife, Kelly, who I'll introduce in just a second. And when he and Lisa began to sing that song, I thought to myself, man, the Holy Spirit really has ordained our morning. More importantly, let me tell you what this does. You see, whenever we lift up the name of Jesus, whenever you lift up the name of Jesus, here's what it does. It's like that hummingbird stuff for the Holy Spirit. When you lift the name of Jesus up, the Holy Spirit hears it. He's like, I need to get over there. So if you don't mind, would you stand with me just a moment? I promise 60 seconds. I know you've stood 30 minutes. That's way, that's way longer than anybody should make you stand in church, right? If you just close your eyes just a second, if you feel comfortable raising your hands, wonderful. If you don't, halfway up. If it's not, just put your hands on your heart. But more importantly than what you do, I want us just to say to the Holy Spirit, be attracted to the auditorium today. Bruce and Lisa, can we sing that chorus just one time? Jesus. And we'll sing it with us. Jesus. Jesus. There's just something. There's just something about Master Savior, Master Savior Jesus, like the fragrance.
Holy Spirit, I know your only job is to just elevate Jesus, to comfort and empower us, but to elevate Jesus. And so as we've done that, we believe that you're attracted to this room. Now, we want you to know we honor you, and we just say to you, we're following what you want to do in the auditorium today. Let everything we do be pleasing in your sight, everything we say. Holy Spirit, we honor you today and your work. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. I like the kid with Lisa, but I've known Bruce and Lisa a long time. I, Pastor Bruce and Lisa, but uh, they, they, are, they are no finer people on the planet than Bruce and Lisa Hughes. Amen. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Except for somebody I brought this morning who's finer than them. Um. Afterwards, when you see her, I, I just want you to know ahead of time, this is my wife and not one of my daughters. I have four of those. So when you look at her and you're like, how in the world are you with her? I did marry way above my grade, thank God. But I want to introduce my wife, Kelly. If you, could you stand so they can just see who you are? This is my beautiful wife, Kelly. Um, we have four daughters and have served at Thrive Church and Apopka almost 30 years. Um, we're, we're honored to be here. Uh, Pastor Scott and Tammy George have, are two of our dear, dear friends. Uh, Scott has been very impactful in my life as far as ministry goes, and so it's always a privilege and an honor to come and uh, to uh, get to preach in his uh, place of ministry. I feel so honored to do that, and I trust by the end of the service today that you're not uh, too excited that he'll be back after I've preached, that you're thinking, dear God, thank God he left, and our pastor's coming back next week. So anyway, um, I'm a huge movie buff for a number of reasons. My, my parents actually in the 70s owned a movie theater when I was an elementary school student. There's nothing better than a kid growing up with his parents owning a movie theater. So I, I saw Jaws 21 times in a row. In hindsight, you probably should not let a nine-year-old see Jaws. Just, it, it might have something to do with my fear that I battle all the time. I don't know about that, but... Um, Anyway, I do blame my parents for that. Everybody said amen. Your parents are fault for everything in your life. <laughs> uh, being in Florida, you know, we have such a, a close uh, connection to the space program. There was a movie a few years ago made about one of the Apollo lawn, um, moon launches, Apollo 13. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. I won't go into a lot of detail, but in the middle of the movie after the explosion's taken place and they're not sure the astronauts are going to live, uh, Ed Harris plays uh, Gene Kranz, who is the flight director. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a point in this movie where uh, they're not sure the, the astronauts are going to live. They're not going to sure they can get it back home safely. And old Gene Kranz uh, stands up and says, look, I don't know who y'all need to call. And I don't know who you need to wake up. But you get them up and you get them here. We've never lost an American in space. And we're certainly not losing one on my watch. And there was a, an absoluteness that was brought to the room simply because one man said, you know what, it might look like everything else is chaos, but we're going to have some order here. And in that, all of these people began to find solutions. When it was nothing but no way, they started figuring out ways to make things work that had never worked before. They actually call it one of the most successful failures in all of space history. When you study the life of King David, who's written a number of the Psalms, you can't help but realize that these are either songs or pieces of poetry that David's written about what he's going through in his life. And certainly, I, I know as Pastor Scott and others have begun to preach through this series, does your heart not just ache at times when you hear David painfully talking about what's going on in his life. I mean, there's some of them, to be honest with you, uh, I can't sleep, I'm tormented on my bed. You know, just over and over, some of the comments that he's making, it just wrenches my heart to think, what in the world was he going through? And, and, I, and I feel his pain at times in my own circumstances, in my own life as I'm battling different things. I think, man, I don't know what he was writing about here, but I can identify with him. One psalm, though, it's interesting because the language seems very um, benign. And benign in the sense that 
the background of why he's written it doesn't match the language. He's actually written the psalm we're going to look at this morning. And, and really, the, the writers of Scripture identified as one of two things. It's either when he's hiding in a cave and Saul's trying to kill him, or it's after his son Absalom has turned everybody against him and he's running for his life, betrayed by his own child. And so I'm thinking, if I'm writing a poem in either one of those circumstances, there would be anger, fear, terror. You mean pick whatever you want. But David's language does not match that. As, as, as a matter of fact, as we begin to look at here in just a moment, it, it's, it's, it's so not lining up with what's going on in his life that many people have read over this psalm and thought it was just, it, it was not one of the grandiose ones. I mean, certainly you got Psalm 103. I know Pastor Scott just preached on that, all the benefits of, of serving God. You got Psalm 91. Uh, you know, I mean, you've got some incredible Psalms, Psalm 23, Psalm 18. I mean, I mean, just incredible Psalms. But the one that I want to look at today is kind of an under the radar Psalm, but it's written against the backdrop of, of, let's just for the sake of picking one, let's say it's when he's hiding in the cave about to lose his life from Saul. It's, it's one of the two. Every theologian says it's one of the two things. So let's just pick one so you understand how dire things are. He feels betrayed. He feels like he's, he's done nothing but serve. And now he's running for his life. And so he begins to write this psalm, and it becomes an answer for this trial. Now, let me tell you how significant the psalm is. Every single year when we get to the fall, the culture of Hebraic studies stops and honors a series of feasts in the fall as well as the spring and the early summer we have three of those that the Lord calls his appointed times I'm really big on believing that those are a calendar of God speaking we've got Passover or what we call Easter whatever you want to talk, call it in the spring that celebrates the fact that we have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb amen then we've got Pentecost that talks about the uh, arrival of the Holy Spirit. But more than that, Pentecost is about the provision that is supposed to come to you for everything you need for a new spiritual season. Then we get to the fall and we have tabernacles. Now, I could really mess up the apple cart and tell you what tabernacles really is, but I don't want Pastor Scott to have to come back and fix it next week. So, but the bottom line is uh, tabernacles is about God dwelling with us. Hang on a second. The actual meaning of tabernacles is God tabernacles with us. Now, can anybody think of any other time when the scripture talks about God becoming flesh and tabernacling with us? Talk about the birth of Christ, right? In John chapter 1 when it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling, that word is tabernacling amongst us. There is much theological belief that Jesus was probably born in tabernacles, not on December 25th. Now, I won't say that out loud. Because I know that for many of you, December 25th is the stop all, and I don't want to mess up your Christmas apple cart. So, touch your neighbor and say, I did not hear that. No, really, touch your neighbor and say, I did not hear that. So Pastor Scott doesn't have to fix it next weekend. So there you go. Amen? In the fall, though, we have something called Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. Many of us call it the Feast of Trumpets. There are many that believe, you know, this is the trump sound when the return of Christ will be. We don't know the day or the hour. The Feast of Trumpets is celebrated on two days. It starts at sundown one day and goes to sundown the next day. Now, here's what's interesting. The Hebraic studies and the Jewish people believe so strongly in the, um, the uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, that for 40 days they make preparation to celebrate. Now here's what's fascinating. The psalm we're about to read, they read all 40 days in a row. They read the psalm we're going to look at, the psalm that David's written about hiding in a cave from Saul. Every single day they get up and read this psalm 
because it tells us something in the midst of his trouble he doesn't despair his language is so incredible in the midst of this incredible circumstance that every single day people will read that in preparation for looking for the return of christ if you've got your bibles this morning why don't we look at this magnificent psalm it's psalm 27 You've got your Bibles and you'd go there. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm intrigued about the whole Christmas thing. <laughs> Touch your neighbor on the other side and say, get used to this. I'm going to be touching you a lot this morning. Just tell them right now. <laughs> All right. Are you there, Psalm 27? We're going to start at verse 1. If you don't mind, can I just say, can I read a couple of verses and then tell you to go home and read the rest of the chapter later? Because i got a lot to talk about, and I want to minister to you, and, and uh, we we got to beat the Baptist to lunch. Everybody said amen to that? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For when the wicked came against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired, verse 4, that I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. He continues over and over and over again now here's what's fascinating everybody look up here. here's what's fascinating about this psalm david mentions the lord's name 13 times in this chapter here he is in the midst of running for his life about to be overcome by saul Saul's army chasing him and David thinking, you know, hey, I'm supposed to be the next king. I'm anointed and all they're doing is trying to kill me. He's running. He's hiding in a cave. And in the midst of his, he pulls this out and writes it. Now, what's fascinating is he doesn't write it as many of the other Psalms as an original creation. He's actually quoting something that Moses had an encounter with God in the book of Exodus. He is actually reciting something that happened in the book of Exodus. If you've got your Bibles, hold your place right there in Psalm 27 and go over, please, with me real quickly to Exodus chapter 33. Can, can, can you go quickly? Are you still with me this morning? Hang with me because this is powerful revelation. It's going it's to be really encouraging to you. So, so here is, touch your neighbor and say, I'm encouraged. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. A friend down here says, tell him to touch your neighbor. I'll touch your neighbor and say, I'm ready to hear this. There are three people in the back saying, who is this guy? You know. My wife feels the same way. I'm trying desperately not to embarrass her, by the way, which is an every week occurrence. Moses on the top of Mount Sinai in Exodus 33. Listen to the conversation he has with God, verse 12. Moses says to the Lord, you're telling me to bring this people to a promised land, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name and have found grace, and I have found grace in your sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know and that I may find grace. And consider that this nation is your people. And God speaks and says, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, I'm not leaving. I'm not bringing these people. In other words, if you're not going, God, I'm not going. I love that, don't you? For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us, so we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the peoples who are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord says to Moses, I will also do this thing you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. So Moses says to God, I know you want me to lead these people and go, but I can't go unless you go with us. I desperately need your presence. And, and, and Moses says what I say to God all the time, can I please see you? I mean, I asked to see my angel 
that, that's supposed to accompany me all the time. And, and, you know, and of course, you know, my wife, you know, who's had such many spiritual experiences in her life, I'm like, I'm praying that God let me see uh, my, an angel. She says, well, I've seen an angel a number of times. I said, sure you, of course you have. You know, God loves you way more than he loves me. It's for, it's for, for absolute certain. I asked the Lord about it one time. I said, why don't you let me see your angel? He goes, well, listen, you, you got a little bit of fear issue going on because you saw Jaws 21 times. If you saw an angel, it would not comfort you. You'd be terrified. So I'm like, okay, well, Lord, I, I appreciate that, that you know that about me. So um, I still would like to try it out. Anybody with you? I'd like to see one just once. Uh, I mean, like a big old massive one. So Moses says, look, I need to see who's going with me. And then he says something. He says, I would really like to see you face to face. Now, this is where you really need to listen. Because God does something remarkable and incredible God in chapter 34 speaks to him and says or actually the end of chapter 33 he says you cannot see my face this is verse 20 you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live and the Lord said here's a place by me you'll stand in the rock and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by but you will see my back as I walk by Skip down to chapter 34. Hang with me really close, really quickly. This is, this is amazing. Chapter 34, um, verse 5. It says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Here's what's interesting. God, in that moment, declares 13 things about himself. They are called the 13 attributes of the grace and mercy of God. It's God's goodness. Here they are, and I made this for you on the way out if you'd like it. They're in the, you just pick it up on the way out. And here's what they, here, listen, listen to what they are real quickly. I'm not going to read them out of Exodus 34. You can, but here's what they are in the Hebrew. It's the Lord, and here's what that one means. It means God is merciful before a person even sins. Even though the future evil might be ahead, God is merciful anyway. The second one, the Lord Adonai, God is merciful after the sinner has gone astray. Isn't this amazing? God says, I'm merciful before you go astray, and I'm merciful after you go astray. Number three, it says it's a name that denotes the power of God as ruler over nature and humankind indicating that God's mercy sometimes surpasses the degree indicated by his name. In other words, the third thing that God describes is, my name is great, but my mercy might even exceed the greatness of my name. Is anybody listening to me this morning? Number four, I'm compassionate. God is filled with sympathy for human frailty. He does not put people into situations of extreme temptation, but he eases the punishment of their guilt. Look, this is not mine. This is God's definition of who he is to Moses. Number five, I'm gracious. I show mercy even to those who do not deserve it, consoling the afflicted and raising up the oppressed. Number six, I'm slow to anger. I give the sinner ample opportunity to reflect, improve, and repent. Number seven, amen, praise God. Number seven, I'm abundant in kindness. I'm kind towards those who lack personal merits providing more gifts and blessings than they deserve. Is anybody listening to me this morning? And if one person's behavior is evenly balanced between virtue and sin, I put my hand on the scale and tip it towards the good. Come on, said somebody get excited with me this morning. Don't make me preach. Come on, somebody. Isn't this amazing? Number eight, truth. God never goes back on his word. He rewards those who serve him. Number nine, this is my favorite. I pray this one regularly. You're a preserver of kindness for a thousand generations. Here's what that means. It means that God remembers the deeds of the righteous for the benefits of their less virtuous generations of offspring. In other words, did you realize that, that God is actually saying when you fail, God will actually look for somebody else in your family line that has been righteous and will credit that to you? Wow. I'm telling you what, people have preached and given God a black eye and a bad name, somebody. 
You're like, that's too good to be true. Amen. It is too good to be true, isn't it? Number 10, he's the forgiver of iniquity. God forgives intentional sin, which I find interesting because I find all sin is intentional. Come on, somebody. I mean, we don't, we don't accidentally sin. <laughs> we might make a mistake. I, I can't go there. That's like Christmas in October. I, I can't mess you up there. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, I didn't hear that. <laughs> Number 11, not only the forgiver of iniquity, but he's the forgiver of willful sin. God is describing himself. Moses says, who's going with me? God says, let me tell you who's going with you. And he just, 13 things. It's in Exodus 34. You can count them. Forgiver of iniquity. Forgiver of willful sin. God, number 10, God even allows those who commit a sin with malicious intent of rebelling against and angering him the opportunity to repent. Is that not amazing? Number 12, forgiver of error. God forgives a sin committed out of carelessness, thoughtlessness, or apathy. And last but not least, God cleanses. He's merciful, gracious, and forgiving, wiping away sin. In other words, look up here, don't miss this. Moses says, look, I'm leading these people. I'm not going unless I know who's going with me. I need you to show me your face. God says, that's not what you need. You don't need to see my face. What you need to see is my goodness and my mercy. Right. And he says, I'm going to hide you right here because if I didn't hide you, you'd be like a kid on Christmas. You'd jump out and say, I want to see your face so bad. Let me see it. But that's not what you need for where you're going. You need to see my goodness. And so as God passes by, this is what Moses sees, these 13 attributes. So understand in Psalm 27, when David's in the midst of the pit, when he knows his life is about to come to an end, he's hiding and running. He's thinking, how can I pull myself out of this pit? He pulls up the Torah, and he pulls up this experience that God has given Moses, and he starts quoting it. If you read Psalm 27, the Lord's name is mentioned 13 times. What David is saying is all these 13 attributes of God, instead of going into depression or going into despair or going into fear or frustration, he starts saying to himself, God is good, God is merciful, God is kind, God is forgiven. He's just speaking. You see, the psalm looks like, wow, David's had this incredible encounter with God, but he's actually in the worst pit of all, but he's saying to himself, look who I'm following. Is that not amazing this morning? Now, here's what's even more fascinating. Take your Bibles and go over to Mark chapter 5 just a moment. Let me show you something really cool. Anybody want to see something cool? Touch your neighbor and say, I'm all for cool. Touch your another neighbor and say, I hadn't been cool in a long time, but I'd like to see what it looks like. Mark chapter 5, this is, this is absolutely fantastic. Verse 21, uh, excuse me, verse 25 for the sake of time. It says, there was a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. And she had suffered many things from many physicians, and she had spent all she had and was no better but grew worse. Anybody heard the story before? When she heard about Jesus... She came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said, Lord, there's a multitude thronging you. What do you mean who touched you? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Isn't that amazing? Now, here, let, me, let me make the connection with you just for a second. 
In Exodus chapter 33 and 34, Moses has this encounter on the top of Mount Sinai. He says, I need to know who's going with me. And God speaks to him 13 things about his mercy and goodness. This is who's going with you. Moses is so empowered that he goes down the mountain and says, we can go forward now. I mean, they still had their issues, but, but Moses, was, he was ready to go now. Years later, King David, in the midst of his struggle and trial, is sitting there not knowing if he's going to live or die. I mean, this is not, hey, the offering wasn't big enough. This is not, I had a hard day at work. This is not one of the kids mouthed off. This is not my wife and I or my husband and I got in an argument or we don't know how we're going to pay this bill. This is, I don't know where I'm going to go. I'm by myself. I'm about to die. And instead of writing his last will and testament, David takes out the encounter that, that, that Moses and God had and he starts quoting saying, God, you're my light and my salvation. In other words, as a result of me receiving your goodness and mercy, I've got light and safety. Anybody listening to me this morning? I've got light and safety. You understand, as a good Jewish woman growing up in synagogue, what she has heard talked about in synagogue are the attributes of the grace and mercy of God. Hang on. You understand that Jesus is a rabbi. So he is wearing one of these. Come on, somebody. You're about, you're about to get blessed here. He's wearing one of these, which is called a tallit. A tallit. And on the end of the tallit, these are called zizits. What she heard about Jesus were the attributes of his mercy. She said, if I can get behind him, like Moses did. Don't make me get off the stage. If I can get behind him, just like Moses did, and touch, here's what's wild. Did you know that this zitzit has five knots and eight strands? Can anybody add? Five plus eight equals, so you understand as Jesus is walking, these seats seats that are behind him are the 13 attributes of the goodness and mercy of God. Come on, somebody. She said, she said, if I can just get behind him, if I can just get behind him, like Moses did, like David did, if I can just get behind him and touch his mercy and his goodness, my life will be transformed. You see, you and I sometimes in the difficulty of our circumstances are so wanting to see some way forward and actually God is saying, if you'll just get behind me and touch my mercy. Stop telling me why you deserve to be answered. Stop telling me how much you've served God and I've given and I've been faithful. It, look, look, that doesn't mean a hill of beans. Just touch my goodness and my mercy. I asked the Lord about it this morning. I'm like, Lord, why didn't you let him see your, this, this is amazing. I asked the Lord this morning, I'm like, Lord, why did you not let him see your face? I mean, I, I get it. I understand goodness and mercy. And the Lord spoke to me and said, this is really cool. Just out of the blue, the Lord spoke to me. He said, actually, the reason I wanted him to see me from behind is I wanted me and him to be going in the same direction. You see, sometimes when you're looking face to face at someone, you forget everything else around you. And Moses had a people to lead. He had a people to get into a promise. And God said, we don't need to, as much as I love fellowship with you, Moses, and you're my friend, if you saw my face, we'd never leave the mountain. Come on, somebody. If, if, I'll give you that one. I like that. That's good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. If we saw the Lord's face, we'd never want to leave the mountain. So God said, look, I don't need you to stay up here. I need you to lead my people. So what I want you to see is that you and I are headed in the same direction. So Moses' perspective is totally different. The same as David's. The same as this woman with the issue of blood who just said, if I can touch the goodness and the mercy of God, I'll be healed. This morning, regardless of what you need, the answer 
is the goodness and the mercy of God. The reason I printed out the 13 things for you to have on the way home is it becomes a prayer journal. It becomes a declaration journal. If you don't believe it works, read King David's psalm that he, that he writes in, 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 in chapter 27. It, it's, it's actually not one of his original creations. He's actually quoting an experience that Moses had on the top of Mount Sinai. The Lord And read, count them for yourself. The Lord's name is mentioned 13 times in the 27th Psalm, if you don't believe me. Any translation you want, here's what's fascinating. Any translation you want to read, NIV, NLT, New King James, King James, the Lord's name is mentioned 13 times in that, in that chapter. You know why? Because God is serious about you and I just getting behind him and touching his goodness and his mercy. Whatever it is you need this morning, the goodness and the mercy of God is available to you. It's ready for you. You can touch it. You can have it. It'll heal your life. It'll save your life. It will lead your life. It will transform your life. It will change your life. It's available to you no matter what you've done yesterday, where you're at today, and even what you might do tomorrow. Is anybody listening to me this morning? I'm telling you, the goodness and mercy of God is overwhelming. It is the path forward. Listen, it worked for Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. It worked for King David in the middle of a trial above all trials. And it, won't, it worked for a woman with the issue of blood who had spent all she had trying to get well. And you know what she said? She made the connection. I've been hearing about the mercy of God in temple. And if Jesus is God in the flesh, then his mercy is dragging behind him. And all I got to do is get in line. Go the same direction he's going and touch the hem of his garment. Man, I love that, don't you? If you don't mind, I'm done. Can I just... Well, that, that didn't come out quite the way I wanted it to. No, no, I'm done, really. In closing, 14 more times, right? My dad says uh, he knows that I've got half an hour left when I say in closing. What I'd like to do is, is pause here for just a moment. Let me pray over all of us. And then um, about um, five days after Passover of this year, Pentecost, uh, the Lord transformed some things about my, my ministry to people uh, where I began to see names and numbers and different things. And so as soon as Scott asked me to pray, uh, preach here a, a few weeks ago, um, the Lord began to show me things um, about, about the service. And, and, and I, don't, I don't know anything about it or what's going on, but if you don't mind, let me just pray for you and then take just a moment and minister to you. Would that be okay? So would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? Heavenly Father, above all else, we trust you've been honored. That in the laughter and few moments of levity and even some hopeful revelation, our only desire is that the attention is squarely on you. Lord, we want you to know how desperately and deeply we love you. And Lord, I'm going to tell you today, I am in need of your mercy and your goodness. I align myself with you this morning. And again, Holy Spirit, we just, we want to cooperate with you. with heads bowed and eyes closed, first of all, if you're here and you've never accepted the goodness and mercy of God being for you, before we go a step further, we need to do that. Because you see, in, in, until you align with the direction that God's going, you'll never get to your destiny and your purpose. You'll never get to your place. You'll, you'll struggle. You'll be, and God will be gracious and kind and patient because that's who he is. But you and I have to align 
with him, which is his mercy and goodness. So with every head bowed and eye closed in this place today, if you'd say, you know what, hey, Kevin, as you're closing this morning, I want to make sure that my life is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I want to accept what the Lord has done in my behalf. So my invitation is, if you'd like to pray that prayer with me, would you just slip your hand up right now? Say, you know what, either I'm not sure, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, that's awesome. Anybody else this morning, just slip it up just a moment and hold it up. Listen, if, if you, let me, let me tell you how you know if, it, if you need it. If you get engaged and serve because you feel like you had a good month or a good year or a good week, or if you come and pray at all the prayer meetings and feel like worshiping because you had a good week, then you're still operating under a works gospel. Listen, if you had the worst week possible and you can come in here and worship and your heart be broken by the presence of God, you know what that means? It means that you've accepted that your redemption has zero to do with your behavior. Your redemption is only by the blood of the Lamb. Now listen, here's the problem. The blood redeems your spirit. The only way your behavior will ever change is being washed by the Word. But here's where we start. Have you accepted? That's what Jesus said when you have to believe. Have you accepted that I did the work on your behalf? I made you righteous. You didn't earn it. I made it. Anybody else before we pray? Can I invite every single person here just to pray this with me out loud for these four or five that are saying yes to the Lord today? Would you say, Heavenly Father? Come on, pray it out loud with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you today that Jesus died for me and by his blood I have been redeemed out of the hand of the enemy I accept that redemption and now declare out loud that I am the righteousness of God through the blood of Jesus Christ and everybody said amen now, they always made the New Testament church pro, uh, testify once they'd met the Lord. So don't you look at somebody next to you and say, I've touched you enough, now I'm going to testify. Are you ready? Say it out. Come on, everybody, say it out loud. I, I got nowhere else to go all day, so I can wait till everybody says it. Or I can have you come up and testify. Why don't you just testify to somebody next to you? Say, I am. I didn't feel any faith in that. Say, I am the righteousness of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.